Hi, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm Joe Mann. I'm a uh, reporter for uh, Reuters and I've covered security for, oh, it'll be 20 years next year. Um, my, my one main job as a, as a panel uh, moderator was to come up with the one slide that uh, listed everybody's names and titles, so uh, you would have to, uh, it, you wouldn't have to keep track, and uh, it didn't make it. So um, I'm just going <laughs> to... I'm just going to refer to people by their full names a lot um, uh, during the middle of this. So uh, to my right uh, is Jennifer Granick, um, who's been um, one of the most prominent lawyers for hackers and around uh, internet security and privacy issues for uh, 25 years, 20 years, something like that. <laughs> uh, most recently, she wrote a great book called American Spies. Uh, she is now at the ACLU. Um, and uh, before that was at um, uh, the Stanford Center for Internet and Society. Uh, next uh, to her right is Paul Rosen, who was chief of staff at DHS, now a partner at Crowell and Mooring. Um, he also worked uh, in Congress and um, has done a, a full sweep of all three branches of, of government, uh, I believe. Um, then we have uh, Al Allison uh, Bender of uh, Zwilgen, a uh, prominent DC firm on uh, such issues. Also DHS veteran, she was uh, a cybersecurity uh, attorney uh, there and um, performed a, a bunch of other functions over the years at DHS, was also at uh, the law firm of uh, Hogan Levels. And then we have uh, Amit uh, Elazari, uh, who is, uh, for a law student, extraordinarily well published um, on technology issues. Uh, she is also a grantee from the Berkeley Center for Long Term Cyber Security. Um, and I, it's Berkeley Law that she's at. Uh, and then finally, the, the one person you really have to worry about if you're a hacker on this panel, most of us are on your side, but uh, not Leonard Bailey. Um, he is. Uh, National Security Council for the DOJ's um, uh, Computer Crime and Intellectual Property section. Um, he's had a number of other interesting jobs at Justice, including working for their uh, Inspector General. So even the people at the Department of Justice have to worry about Leonard Bailey. Uh, so uh, pretty even-handed there. So I thought what we'd do, I, wanted, I want this to be a, a lot of back and forth. So um, there are a lot of things that have happened in the last year. Uh, in the courts um, and in various legislative bodies uh, here in, in, in Europe in particular that are of interest. I want to, I'm going to call on pe the panelists to give a couple minutes talking about um, uh, each of these topics and there'll be a little crossfire. Uh, and then when we get through a couple rounds of that, then I'll open it up to, uh, to the floor. Um, I want to start with, with Jennifer and the Carpenter decision, which isn't really about hacking per se, uh, but that's the thing where the Supreme Court said, you know, actually, you know, what's on your cell phone and where you are uh, is, is something that uh, you might uh, want to get probable cause or meet some other standard, which you will explain, mm -hmm. uh, rather than them just taking it because they want it. So I think it, I guess it impacts um, hackers slash security researchers in uh, in what they could be on on the hook for a little bit more. It's now clear that it's not, you know, you, it's not all, uh, it's some of it's sensitive and it might have an impact on what the government can do when it's trying to find out uh, stuff through hacking or, or other means. So uh, yeah, Jennifer, take it away. For sure. I mean, I think we'll look back and think of Carpenter as one of the most important privacy and civil liberties cases of the decade. It was a case that involved cell site location information and whether the government can collect that information from cell phone providers without a warrant. Um, it, the case was particularly important because as people in this room know, almost everything we do today is stored in the cloud. Um, and the government's argument for years has been this kind of bright line rule that if you have information that is in the hands of third parties, it's not private, it's not protected by the Fourth Amendment, and that means that police don't need to get a warrant. And the warrant uh, procedure is an important protector because it means that an agent has to go to a judge who is an independent authority, convince the judge that there is a good reason for the investigation, and then the search has to be um, with particularity targeted at the, obtaining the evidence of the crime. And so if you had this bright line rule that the government had, had pushed, which is um, anything that's in the hands of third parties, you know, maybe it was bank records and the phone numbers you dialed back in the 70s, but today it would be everything. 
And so uh, what Carpenter challenged, what we challenged, um, uh, and ACLU was counsel for the defendant, was this idea that there's this bright line rule, that you know this third party doctrine means there's no Fourth Amendment uh, issue. And the court, the Supreme Court in Carpenter, um, rejected the government's argument and said, you know, there is this information because of how pervasive, because of how revealing, because of how intimate it is, because of the pervasiveness and the necessity of cell phones in modern life um, is protected by the Fourth Amendment and the government has to get a warrant to obtain it. Now the court cautioned and said, you know, this is a very narrow ruling, it's just about this type of data, but you can see that it actually has a broad uh, potential implication as now instead of there just being this idea, well, we know anything in the hands of third parties you don't need a warrant for, now we can see that we're going to make this question, ask this question about what level of protection information receives on a case by case basis or rather a type of information by type of information basis. So. Uh, this is the beginning of the end of the free-for-all that the government has enjoyed for the past decade or so. And uh, I think that that's why we'll look back and think of Carpenter as such a landmark case. I want to ask um, anybody else on the panel that wants to jump in there. So if location information is now, you need a warrant for that, you shouldn't do uh, drag nets, what, what are the next logical things to fall if you guys think that other things will fall? What else is going to be... What else is there a really good argument uh, for, for doing away with the third party doctrine? Leonard? Well, so I, I think that's one of the, the difficulties with the Carpenter decision. Uh, I, I totally agree with, um, with, with Jennifer that it's going to be a very significant decision. The problem I think we'll see is we're not sure how to apply it yet. Is it a case about location information? Is it a case about cell phones? What is, what is it that is now protected? And I think we're gonna have you know, many years is a full employment act for me, so that's that's okay. But uh, <laughs> many years of people coming back and saying, so this technology, is this covered? How about this one? And uh, it's, I would put it in the same realm as some other Supreme Court cases we've had recently. I, I would put Jones in the same uh, place where the ability to use it prospectively to condition law enforcement investigators' conduct is, is not so great because we're not quite sure what the case actually means. It doesn't draw a bright line that we can apply kind of proactively. The, the downside of not knowing what the case means is get a warrant. So I'm, o I'm okay with living with that uncertainty. So two, two thoughts from... <laughs> poor, I have two words, poor Leonard. Um, so. Two, two thoughts. Um, first of all, just a distinction. We're dealing with historical location information. Where was a person, not real time, which has long required a warrant. Um, and, and sort of to the, to the question about what's next, what I've seen in the case law, particularly in the Fourth Amendment area, is the court focusing, as Leonard pointed to, the Jones case, which is about a, a, attaching a, a tracker to a car on a public street and following that car around when w requires a warrant, when a police officer getting in the car and following the car around does it. So using technology for traditional law enforcement techniques and thinking about that that way, one of the areas I think we're going to see more and more of this and. I know Jennifer and ACLU are active in this area is border search authority. Um, what can government agents at the border where historically a warrant uh, is not necessary, what can they search with little or no cause? Can they search a cell phone like they can rifle through papers? I think that's sort of actively going to be litigated over the next months and years. Yeah, the ACLU is litigating that now. I just want to take a minute to say um, the, what I say is my own thoughts. It's not the ACLU's unless I say the ACLU did this or that. So just to be clear. But it is legal advice, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if, if, if the courts have held that the government can't necessarily use technology to do something as, as a shortcut to do something that they can do in the real world, it seems to be what you were saying with Jones. Does that mean that it, it is so facial surveillance technology, cameras everywhere, that even though you're on a public street, the government should not no longer be able to flip through all those cameras and, and see where you are at any given time? Is that a logical extension, Darryl? Well, I'll just throw this 
balloon in the air and then stop talking, um, license plate reader information, yeah. right? So traditionally, police can go to data brokers that are in the business of collecting from public places or private places, like a, think of a bank security camera. You know, that bank may sell what is on that camera to a data broker that may take all the license plate information, and then it sort of has this database. That's another issue that I think we're gonna see litigated as well. Yeah. I mean, I think the idea that you have no privacy in public um, that sort of other bright line rule, uh, the Jones case involving the GPS tracker calls that into serious question as well. And that'll be a big issue with, with face surveillance. And then ultimately the secondary issue of once you have information in the hands of private parties, when can those private parties divulge it to the government voluntarily? I mean, yeah, I mean, sorry. Uh, I would just add to that with respect to the um, really important point with respect to technological advancements and how this is going to affect this landscape that a lot could be learned from cases that involve like COPA, children privacy, and what basically technology has been used to circumvent permissions and infer location using other techniques like looking at the Wi-Fi infrastructure. For example, in the Inmobi case, right, the FTC pursue um, that, that uh, basically investigation, although it wasn't exact location, it was location inferred by technological de developments. So it looks like whatever is going to happen in the private sectors, even in specific enforcement actions and regulations involving private parties will influence to some extent at least the technological discussion. All right, uh, I want to keep going because uh, I don't know what the, the audience is going to find most interesting, but I want to give them a nice selection of things to choose from. So, Paul Rosen, I, I'd like you to talk about um, uh, California privacy law and also government, sort of the, the state of U U.S. government enforcement of hacking law in, in, in a variety of means, SEC, FBI, all that stuff in the last year or so. Oh, yeah, I got like 45 and seconds. And you got about two minutes. Um, so briefly, this sort of the government enforcement landscape when it comes to cybersecurity and privacy issues. So on the one hand, you have government regulators like the Federal Trade Commission, states attorney generals, the SEC, they all have their different mandates. But generally speaking, what, it, what, what agencies like the FTC are focused on are, is on protecting consumer fairness. And what that means and how that's been interpreted in the privacy and cybersecurity context is that if a business is not adequately or reasonably protecting the information that it collects, then the government has the ability to go after uh, that business for violations under the authority of the Federal Trade Commission, Section 5 of the, of the FTC Act. And what we're seeing is this evolving landscape where cases are being litigated in court, they're coming out different ways because this, in, this landscape of what is fair, what is reasonable, how many precautions should a business take, that's, reasonableness is, is sort of in the eye of the beholder. So at, on the one hand, you've got agencies doing that. Um, you've got the SEC dealing with public and other companies saying, if you have a cyber incident, uh, that may be material and you have to disclose that from an SEC investor securities perspective. And, um, and states attorneys general are getting involved. We'll talk about the California Privacy Act, but the other piece I wanna mention briefly that I'm sure Leonard could add to is you've got this sort of criminal element hanging out there. Now, you know, the, the, the law, law enforcement is not generally gonna go after a victim. Um, well, they're not gonna go after a victim, but you have these criminal issues weaved in. What do I mean by that? Say there's a big breach and an employee decides to trade and dump all his, his or her stock, right? And that implicates insider trading issues. We saw that uh, and we've seen uh, at least two individuals charged in Equifax. Um, and then of course, government goes after the hackers because um, hacking is a crime under state and federal law, unauthorized access. So there's a criminal element there. Maybe I'll stop there and um, we can pick up. Well, once you hit the California privacy, uh, sure. Boondoggle. So <laughs> briefly, um, and I know we're going to hear a little bit about GDPR, but California just enacted a very strict 
privacy law that goes uh, into effect in January 2020, and it gives consumers a host of rights. I'm not going to go into them, but essentially lets consumers find out from businesses doing business in California what information they're collecting, what categories of information they have, the right to opt out, and it gives consumers a lot of, of power over businesses in that regard. And the, the key, I think the biggest point, I think, is it creates a private right of action for individuals. That means that they can sue the business, and that means that plaintiff's lawyers are gonna be very active uh, trying to get class action lawsuits together anytime there's a breach, no matter whether that information was ever used nefariously or not. So uh, what does this do to the, the Facebooks, and, and I'll open this up to the, to the panel, what does this do to the, the California law, what does that do to the Facebooks and Googles of the world? Does it make their lives you know, uh, completely miserable, or is it just the same as, they're, as if they're trying to do business in Europe? So I think with the California law, because there's such a long time frame before it enters into effect, that um, there are a lot of companies that are thinking about how this will affect them, and also what changes might be able to be made to the law before it finally enters into effect. Um, in many ways, it's arguably more um, robust in some of its requirements than even the GDPR. And so thinking out about how to navigate the global landscape of requirements um, and hopefully harmonize some of those will be something on the agenda for the next year. And I also wanted to uh, maybe ask Leonard this, in, in terms of, uh, of prosecution or other, uh, other steps, both against um, hackers themselves and against companies that, have, uh, that weren't keeping up to a reasonable standard, that weren't being reasonable in protecting data, um, has there been anything dramatic happening in the last year or so? I mean, I know there have been, there, you know, there are always some hacker takedowns, but um, have any more corporate executives besides our friends at Equifax really felt pressure, do you think, from the government? Well, so I think this was mentioned earlier, we're kind of in an odd position at, at Justice in regard to our prosecution of, of cyber intrusions and attacks. We are constantly encouraging companies to come forward and report cyber incidents uh, because frankly, it, it helps the entire ecosystem. It allows us to find linkages and to go after larger, more significant, higher value um, targets. Uh, at the same time, there are concerns because of regulatory uh, action, enforcement actions are taken against companies that don't have sufficient, um, you know, haven't taken sufficient care of, of the data that they, that they possess. We like to make it clear that we are not a regulatory agency on the criminal enforcement side. Uh, when we get a report of a crime, our job is to go after the perpetrator, see if we can identify who's responsible and apprehend him or her. Um, now, if there are issues about the safeguarding of information, there are other agencies that do take care of that. The FTC has been you know, very good uh, and very dogged at that. Um, you know, we think they're doing great work, uh, but we don't do the same job. Uh, and so we, we have, we're in the position of trying to explain that often because there is some tension. Uh, we've heard from, from companies saying, I wish the, 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 the uh, government could speak with one voice there. Uh, coming to us and, and, and suggesting they'll help in one hand when we have a breach, and the other hand, they're taking a cudgel to us. Uh, so, you know, we, we've, we've, we're constantly in business of trying to educate victims about our role as uh, criminal enforcement, law enforcement, mm -hmm. in, in dealing with, with intrusions. All right. Um, I have probably a good time then going from California. Uh, Allison, uh, can you uh, tell us about GDPR? Because there is no they don't have any more time to try and change that. that that's actually the law now. No, it, uh, it entered into effect on May 25th of this year, which uh, if you weren't involved in helping your company identify the security measures that support compliance, uh, you certainly received a flood of updated privacy notices in your email inbox. Um, so for this crowd, though, I think um, the GDPR has more impact for the information security community when it comes down to how you respond to an incident under these new and fairly aggressive timelines for reporting of an incident. Uh, if you're US-based, you may be used to being able to take a reasonable amount of time to assess whether a breach has occurred, and then upon determination that a breach has in fact occurred, then you report. And that very often allows for a fulsome investigation into what happened, um, because the law there allows for it. With the GDPR, however, the, the language is different. Um, it requires you to notify within 72 hours on becoming aware that a personal data breach has occurred. 
and for the network defenders and the information security management community, what that means is that the board and senior leadership and lawyers and the privacy office are going to be asking much more aggressive questions about what do we know? When did we know it? So the question that you may be faced with over the coming weeks is, okay, we know there was remote access. Has a breach occurred? We've seen the harvesting of credentials. What else do we know? Where did those credentials go? Did they access the database? Has there been exfiltration? And when you think about that cycle uh, and all the work that goes, in, goes into assessing the logs and the malware, et cetera, it's probably not going to happen for most companies in that 72 hour time frame. So thinking about how you talk through the forensic investigation life cycle, being very clear with what you know and what you also don't know will help with that risk management process uh, and ensure that the notifications that are required are clear and don't invite more of the um, panic and alarm that you sometimes see with premature notifications or incomplete notifications to supervisory authorities or individuals. I'm interested in, in what other uh, other people's thoughts are on GDPR. Uh, among other things, there's been uh, there's been some fretting that it'll make um, security research, uh, even government research, more difficult uh, because who is records uh, might be harder to come by. There are sort of a lot of a lot of sort of intermediaries that aren't going to be as forthcoming with information. Um, do you see that uh, Leonard having any impact on you know joint U.S. European investigations, which are pretty common? So I, the short answer for me is I don't think we know. Uh, I, I keep going to cybersecurity conferences and a GDPR conference will break out in the middle of them. Um, for, 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 for like a year, we've been asking what does GDPR mean? The, the answer, and I'm not a privacy law expert, but the answer I keep coming to is it's going to slowly form as the data privacy authorities decide how they're going to enforce it and interpret it. And we will understand better what the chilling effect is. I mean, right now, I think there are a lot of people who are afraid, a lot of companies are afraid. Um, and that may lead to caution in terms of, you know, because of the potential of these very large significant damage, damage um, uh, amounts that, 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 that could be awarded as a result of violating the GDPR. But I think we'll have to wait and see. I mean, I think it could be enforced in a way that maybe isn't going to produce the, the parade of horribles that people are concerned about. Um, I think that, what we'll see with the GDPR is that it's going to put companies in the pressure cooker, kind of, sort of like we're seeing now with fake news and, and censorship, which the GDPR affects. But I think, you know, there's this, um, there's this demand, um, not unreasonably on the part of law enforcement, for companies that have information to disclose that information to help with investigations. And there's this countervailing pressure also from government for companies to delete information that they don't need, um, to anonymize data, and to um, you know, protect people's privacy. And these two demands from governments are you know, in direct opposition to each other, and so the squeeze will be on companies. How much can you help and also protect people's privacy? and what are the gradations of that. And there's just going to be a lot of demands and companies are going to have to navigate those responsibilities. All right, um, it, let's move along then. Uh, Amit Elazari, um, can you talk to me a little bit about uh, algorithmic transparency and, and, and fairness? It seems like there's one of the really interesting things that's happening in the Valley generally is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the, and the scrutiny around that. Um, I think it's, it's coming from a lot of reasons, but you know, it seems that even the, many of the practitioners don't know exactly how these black boxes work when they kick out recommendations. And uh, I think that has certainly has an impact on lots of sort of justice issues, but maybe it also has impact on um, on, on privacy and, and security work. So what's and, your thing on that? And there is actually there is a connection here to the GDPR because I personally think that GDPR, SEC regime, FTC now thinking that it will be unreason it's unreasonable not to patch a vulnerability you're aware of. All that leads to the, the fact that the price tag on a data breach is going high, high, high. So you want to work with the community. You want to be able to have the channels to communicate with them that are inviting them to work with you. And this is to start with vulnerability disclosure program, but also bug bounties. And we're going to talk about it more, but to connect this line of thought with the crowdsourcing of algorithmic auditing practices, it's the same idea. 
the idea is that these are black boxes. These are machine learning algorithms that only a very unique set of experts now in Silicon Valley in, the, in academia have the expertise to tinker with. And we wanna, what we want to do, and the GDPR touches on it because the GDPR has language with respect to algorithmic decision making. We see now more and more traction around it. What we want to do is to create the same style of mechanism of crowdsourced market that we now have in security after decades right, of experience with that in the field of AI. Those auditors, we are now starting to see CFAA decisions, meaningful decisions around scraping, the Senvik decision coming from the ACLU and their remarkable work. This is about, this is about allowing people that have the expertise to actually uncover whatever is going around in the black box that are free from capture because they're objective and being able to do it basically without risk of you know, legal, legal liability. And I think this is the first step is to remove those barriers and the next step is to create a market that we will crowdsource it and this is a way that we will be able to meaningfully have a conversation about machine learning and fairness and justice because we will have the help of the experts. We will create a new generation of white hat hackers, if you want, in this field. Uh, anybody else want to uh, jump in on that or, or we'll give you a chance to think about it? Well, I, I can say um, on this issue that I, I think there has to be a general consensus that machine learning is not ready for um, prime time important use. Um, the ACLU did a test recently on Amazon's facial recognition technology and ran the members of Congress through the technology and 20 something of them were identified or connected as being criminals in the mugshot database. And uh, which whereas, may whereas, be true, but right. for a different reason. Um, and the algorithm was disproportionately wrong for people of color. So we can see that this technology has serious problems with it. And yet similar kinds of machine learning are already being used to set bail for people and for sentencing, um, as Amit mentioned, to serve people housing, uh, housing and job um, opportunities, which could also be um, racially or gender discriminatory. And you know, so, so the more you know about it, the more you know that it's not something that very important decisions can depend on. And yet the demand is already out there and these, these programs are already being implemented and we need to be exceedingly careful about that and roll some of those uses back. Uh, all right, Leonard Bailey of the United States Department of Justice. <laughs> I'm still paying my penance for not getting the slide up there. Sorry. Uh, I, want to talk, uh, I want to hear from you about uh, government hacking in, in, in two ways. Uh, first of all, the sort of criminal investigations uh, where uh, government should be, well many people think the government should be doing some hacking. Uh, and then uh, overseas, uh, there was a uh, recently passed um, National Defense Authorization Act, which moved around, it seemed like, some titles under which cyber operations uh, can, can be carried out. And it seemed like the bottom line is it made it easier for field commanders to, um, to authorize uh, uh, cyber operations. So if you could interpret the law for us a little bit on that one and, and talk about uh, for the state of play in government hacking, that would be, that'd be awesome. Okay, so that's, that's, there's a lot to cover, so I will speak extraordinarily quickly uh, to try to get through all of this. Uh, so th in those two areas, there's one issue I'll cover which relates to um, an amendment to the rules that cover the um, remote search of computers that was put into effect December of 2016. And then I'll, I'll talk about the NDAA provision. So starting on the, the first provision, under Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, um, this is a rule that dictates how and when the government can get a warrant um, to search property or seize property. Uh, in that provision, there was a requirement that you go to the court in the district where the search would happen. And this is usually fine, you know where the house is, if you have some property in your hands, you know where to conduct the search. But where we were conducting a remote search, it, it in some cases causes a problem. So let's say you have an extortionist who is um, sending extortionate threats to a company. And we craft an email that had an attachment that you know, when opened by the extortionist, it would you know, conduct some activity on, on his or her computer and provide us with some information that will help us identify and track him or her. 
Now that's activity that implicates the Fourth Amendment. We would get a warrant for that. But the problem was we didn't know where that search would happen. In fact, that's why we're getting the warrant. We're trying to track the individual. Uh, and so it created this conundrum of, you know, how do we use this provision? Uh, so we went through a three-year process uh, that involved hearings, written documents, uh, approval by the Supreme Court, and review by Congress uh, to get an, a, an amendment to Rule 41 that allowed us to go, instead of to where the search was conducted, to a place where criminal conduct related to the offense was committed. And we could use that authority where there was some technological measure used to conceal the location. So if you used a proxy server, for example, to send that extortion email, we could use this provision. Subject to all the other requirements we had to get before under Rule 41. But this, was, this allowed us to and clarified that we could get a warrant someplace other than where the search occurred. Now that wasn't the only authority we got under Rule 41 there, we got also authority that related to botnets. Um, because we ran into a separate problem. The department has been conducting botnet takedowns and disruptions, several, for the last six years. Uh, and um, one thing that happens there is there are obviously hundreds of thousands of computers that can be involved in a botnet that are across the country, if not across the globe. And if we had to go to, again, where the search happened, we might have to go to 94 different districts to get a warrant, which was administratively essentially impossible. Um, and so as we were working with botnets over time, our authority to, to do what we needed to do to disrupt the botnet using merely criminal uh, civil injunctions became, let's say, tenuous. We saw some, some things we were doing that required a warrant, so we wanted to go and get a warrant. But again, we ran into the same problem. We got an amendment also that allows us to, again, get a warrant where conduct related to the criminal activity occurs, uh, where, one, there's an investigation of a violation of 1030A5, uh, 18 U.S.C. 1030A5, which is the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the federal hacking statute specifically for conduct that damages the computer. Uh, two, uh, where uh, the thing search, the protected computer, has been damaged by unauthorized access. And lastly, where you had computers in five or more districts. So again, trying to tie this specifically to botnet activity. We've used this authority several times. There have been some public accounts of it in Forbes and in Ar uh, Ars Technica, um, kind of relating the sorts of cases we've used them in. Uh, a sextortion case, a case where someone on the on the dark web, um, I know I should say that in a way that makes it sound more nefarious, the dark web, um, <laughs> uh, where they were attempting to buy car bombs and mail bombs. Um, and so far, we have had no adverse court opinions or technical outcomes in the time we've used it since December of 2016. Um, so that's that. On the NDAA, uh, the quick thing there, and this is not my area of law really, uh, but uh, there is a pending bill, uh, pending legislation uh, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2019 that has three provisions that might be of interest. The first is a provision that essentially reaffirms the Secretary of Defense's authority to conduct activities and operations in cyberspace. What's significant is that it underscores conducting those activities in something other than an area of hostility or in something other than a time of hostility, which means um, somewhere outside of an armed conflict, something outside of the context of a shooting war. Uh, the second thing uh, that the bill currently does is it provides, um, well, it, it, it essentially asserts that these sorts of operations are to be considered traditional military activity. Why does that matter? Because under 15 U.S.C. 3093, which is a covert action statute, um, many of the activities that is described might be considered covert action, which is kind of defined to be some activity the government conducts uh, that will influence economic, political, or military uh, circumstances where the U.S. presence or uh, role in the activity is not apparent and will not be publicly acknowledged. Uh, now, while that might otherwise apply to the military activity, there are carve-outs in the covert action statute for things like counterintelligence activities and for traditional military activity. So what the bill does currently is essentially uh, puts this activity in the carve out to the covert action statute, which has certain requirements that involve reporting to Congress, um, certain types of appropriations being used, and certain presidential findings being made. The last provision I think that may be of some interest from the NDAA is this provision that um, essentially is Congress's attempt to provide some support to the executive branch to conduct cyber operations against four specific named countries. Russia, China, um, North Korea, and Iran, 
where they engage in cyber attacks and cyber intrusions um, against the United States, uh, including for purposes of influencing our elections and our democratic process. Uh, essentially, the language is, I believe, from Congress, an indication that they would support such activity. It's not a direction to do so. They cannot direct the president to take such action, but um, it is essentially a sign that Congress would support such action. So, um, so that's very new law, uh, if, if it even has passed, uh, and it's probably going to take a while before we find out exactly what actions have been taken in, in against those countries, for example, and it's going to be very interesting when we do. But um, I know that the Rule 41 change has been around for longer, um, as some of the bots ha botnet takedowns have also had some some collateral damage, some some you know third parties getting impacted. So none by the United, none none in actions that the United States has. Has done. We've conducted six botnet takedowns. We have not had any complaints about a technical issue. There have been some conducted by private parties where there were such complaints, but none by the government. <laughs> I, I would just feel a little shortchanged if the ACLU or or, or or any of the other members of the panel didn't have any concerns about the rule. Yes, I would be shocked too. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, th this is not an official ACLU opinion, but I can tell you that in the civil liberties community, we had a lot of concerns about the Rule 41 change. And the reason was because in this whole discussion, I, Leonard explained it greatly, and he explained why the government was interested. But underneath that is an assumption and the assumption is that the government should be doing remote searches of computers. And if you think about that assumption, it really glides over a lot of things. So today in the keynote, Parisa asked how many people were on defense. So for the defenders out there, nobody's raising their hand. These are all, yeah, some defenders out there. How do you want, how do you feel about now facing your own government as a well-financed and incentivized attacker on the network as opposed to somebody who wants to defend, because if they're gonna, these are, there's a value in these exploits now. How are you gonna feel about calling the government in when you get hacked and asking for help? How, what, do you, what kind of resources are you gonna have to put in when you're not just defending yourself against you know, China and uh, Israel, but you're defending against the United States as well? And then you look at the corollaries of what you know, is sort of necessitated by remote hacking. It means that the government is going to be um, hoarding some amount of vulnerabilities or exploits. And you know, what we've seen is that those get lost. Um, the NSA vulnerabilities got lost and then hackers took them and turned it into WannaCry, which was a global catastrophe for both financial reasons and for ch dangers to people's health. So, you know, the idea that remote searches are like a given or something that we should definitely buy into, it doesn't make sense to me. There are so many collateral problems that are associated with it that a warrant requirement, even one that satisfies the new Rule 41, um, just don't adequately address. All right, I think, I think we ought to go to more of a, a lightning round here. Leonard, do you want to respond to that and then maybe go, go into the, um, the perennial uh, favorite of hacking back, which seems to come up, uh, I don't know, every, every year or so. And the cyber conference with a hack back. I, I, right. my, my feeling like, like, this year was the vibe was like, well, there's a lot of prosecutorial discretion. Like we're really, you know, we're probably not going to come after Mandiant, you know, if they're snooping on the, on the Chinese and the North Koreans more than they're supposed to. I mean, that was, that was kind of the vibe I was getting, um, but maybe you can give us something more concrete than a vibe. Okay, well, uh, one, quick, one quick response uh, to the other question, which is not really a response, but it's a general observation, which maybe touches on Carpenter as well. I, I find one thing that's fascinating about the laws that's developing in this area, um, which is we seem to have a reaction to activities that involve computers that somehow are decoupled from what happens in the real world. So I've talked to people who basically the reaction is, you can remotely search computers, that's pretty creepy. Like, we can get a warrant to search your house and all the belongings in your house. And we've been able to do that for hundreds of years. And somehow the computer seems creepier to people than, than that. So I, I, it's, it's sort of this interesting way of, of like we seem to be regarding things that are happening in this other space using different 
standards for some reason. I think there's two reasons for that. One, the Supreme Court recognized in the Carpenter case, which is that our devices have more personal information about us and you can tell more about us from them than you can just walking through our house. And the other is that in the um, remote search context, uh, in you know these investigations, you get one warrant and it allows you to search thousands and thousands of computers, whereas it takes you know a couple of police officers to search a single house. So just the whole uh, you know economics of when you search and what you search for is upended by technology. I get that, although the the fact that the house is still the home is still like the most sacred. Absolutely. Under Fourth Amendment, you know, jurisprudence. It, it, anyway. It, yeah. So jumping to hackback. Um, so I. I the department's view on hackback has always been, I guess it's well known, we are not fans of, of hackback. Um, the things that we though, want to clarify with folks is, one, there's obviously a, a, a challenge with the lexicon. Um, over the years, we've gotten these different terms from active defense to countermeasures to defensive actions. Um, and we view hackback as a subset of certain other, other activities. So active defense, for example, we view as a spectrum of activities that, that span from fairly passive monitoring um, through things that involve maybe tracking information to perhaps securing data that's been taken and, and, and that was stolen uh, to imposing costs on someone who was taking your information. So it's a spectrum of activity. We see hacking back as sort of the uh, attempt you know, in, in reprisal to impose costs on someone that is farther at this end of the spectrum. Um, our problems with hacking back aren't that it's illegal. It, it, it is. There's no self-help provision under the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, but it's actually that it's, we have difficulty with why it's good policy. Uh, we've talked to a lot of companies, um, including those that have championed it before, to, to find out what they're doing and why why they're doing it. And we have struggled to find use cases that demonstrate um, a good scalable reason to make hacking back available to, to everyone as a matter of course and concerns that doing so would actually result in a less secure cybersecurity kind of environment. Um, there are also some fallacies built into it, things like I'm going to be able to see my data as it leaves the network, chase it to a site, get to it and secure it. When you talk about dwell time of intruders on a network in terms of weeks and months, not, not minutes, uh, and how is it that you have access to this remote site where your data may be, um, unless maybe you're breaking into that site, uh, in which case, are we actually in a better place if we now have you breaking into another site as well? Okay, uh, coming, again, lightning round, so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, just, just briefly, um, I'm going to go to each of the remaining panelists here. Uh, Amit, um, bug bounties. Uh, I think the most interesting thing that happened in, in bug bounties uh, was, was the was the Uber case uh, this year. That that was really interesting. Is is the line moving? Is the line clear on on what what's extortion and what's what's a proper bounty that that all God fearing Americans should love? And I'm so happy that you raised that question. So. Bug bounties are, of course, exploding, and it's not just bug bounties, vulnerability disclosure programs, so even programs that you're just, you have a channel of communication with the community, you're not paying, you're not incentivizing uh, bug reports, but you have a channel of communication. That is, regulators are pushing that, the FTC suggests that it might be unreasonable not to have that kind of educate measure to, to communicate uh, with the community. And with the explosion of bug bounties, we now see murkiness around what should be the policy, what are, where are the boundaries. And when it comes to the Uber case, what happened there, it was clearly beyond the scope of any traditional bug bounty policy. I've read hundreds of terms of use of bug bounty policy, and I can share with you, most of them are now having a clear provision that when you get to user's data, you need to stop right there. Minimization of harm for users, right? And what happened there, according to the report, seems to be out of scope of any traditional bug bounty. Therefore, the company could have pursued legal action. They could have done that. And when we conflate extortion, basically out of scope activity, and trying to negotiate bugs, even though you're clearly out of scope, with traditional bug bounty that is done with people that have background checks under clear policy, in a community that works with trust, 
then we basically we comp we make the conversation much more complex. So the main lesson from Uber was bug bounties are important. If you, even if you look at the FTC decision after what happened, they don't say stop your bug bounty. They said to Uber maintain your bug bounty. But we need to start paying careful attention to how we scope technical scope third party rights that you're putting inside your bug bounty scope authorization and a safe harbor for your good guys and basically putting the legal team to work on stuff that for years have been basically stuff that mostly the red team have been working on and was no, no legal attention to because it matters and it could lead to a serious serious trust issue in all of this community so that's why i like to separate the conversation around extortion from bug bounties, and in my opinion, you could solve it with a very clear policy that's saying if you go out of scope, that's actionable. Okay, I'm, um, I'm afraid the, the, the time is getting away from us here. I didn't want to cut off the back and forth between uh, particularly ACLU and our government. Um, that's, <laughs> that's entertainment, folks. Um, These are my opinions. <laughs> so uh, if you want to line up for questions, I'm, I'm gonna, we'll just go to that now. Uh, we have a mic there, I see a mic there. I'm guessing there's a mic there. Um, and uh, one of the things we didn't get to uh, was back doors, and I can tell you that Jennifer Granick, at least personally, is against them. Um, so I don't, I don't think we need to beat that to death. Okay, let's, let's start over there. Uh, yes, um, question regarding how GDPR and the California Privacy Act is going to impact a lot of the free services. I know Google was in the news with regards to allowing developers to scan inboxes to provide advertisements and whatnot, and the use of that data. Um, all this is kind of coming to light because you got a lot of developers who have access to your data for the freemiums and they're being approached by marketers and whatnot to try to gain access to that data. I mean, what is your thoughts and how that's going to change the landscape for a lot of these popular applications like Gmail and Facebook? So I think, I think there's going to be a period of time where there's more of a cloud until companies catch up on their compliance obligations. Uh, most companies are not fully compliant with the GDPR now. I'd be very surprised if there's any. Um, there's, there's so much that has to be done in terms of you know, whose data do you have? How is it collected? Who's processing it? Where are the data flows going? Have you considered uh, encryption, pseudonymization, minimization of the data? How are you tracking the records? It is a huge housekeeping exercise in terms of just even figuring out these things. And once that becomes clear or more clear, I think companies will, will turn back to thinking about how they can offer consumers services that are free or freemium, but in a way that's fully informed by privacy policies and in terms of use. Right now, people are just struggling with the volume that it takes to do all of those activities, um, hopefully before May 25th, but certainly on an ongoing basis. Right. Over here. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's uh, it's really it's really insightful today. I want to. We only spent about thirty seconds talking about uh, criminal aspect, and I wanted to get into that a little bit further. In the physical world, attribution is a certain problem. In the uh, computer world, attribution is perhaps a, a different problem, more a much more complex problem. Uh, is the current standard of attribution sufficient, or or where are we going with that? Any opinions on that? Leonard, you're in the criminal business. Well, I think it depends on what you're using attribution for. So in a criminal context, we need you know, attribution that the fingers are on the keyboard with the person who we're accusing of the crime. In other areas where the government works, we don't need to identify the individual, but we do need to identify whether they are a state actor, for example. Because if you're going to levy certain types of, of sanctions against the government, that's all you, you need to know. Um, you know, in, in other instances, that may not matter. You need to know what country it's coming from because you need to know where to go to say, you guys need to figure out how to stop this. And so it, it does present different challenges along a, a slipknot of, of, of remedies that you may be trying to, to pursue. But the, the, uh, just to add sort of, it's, it's the same traditional notions of law enforcement, right? So, you know, person who robbed the bank is six feet, dark hair, ran from this direction, got in a red car, right? Attribution on the forensic side. It's very difficult to fake facts like that. <laughs> well, I think attribution in the forensic world, you're looking at corroborative issues when you're saying, okay, well, there's IP information and other digital information, but you have, maybe you have an email address and you get subscriber information. And so I think the principles, interestingly enough, are similar. 
One thing just quickly to watch for, the Massachusetts legislature recently enacted amendments to its data breach notification law, which included a requirement to um, include who was directly responsible for the breach. It went up to the governor, the governor sent it back, but it's unclear exactly how the legislature is gonna take that going forward, which is something to watch. Um, I'm, I'm afraid they're, they're threatening us here and we have to get up the stage, um, but, um... See if you can find us afterwards for, for questions uh, outside if there's, if there's anything that's really burning. Thanks a lot.